Okay. Uh, what I'm going to be reading, you'll be really happy to hear, is only a part <laughs> of, uh, of, of, a mem of a memoir that I uh, wrote some years ago. I took an Ollie class for eight years on memoir writing, so I have a very large box of memoirs. But since Haiti has been in the news, and I thought that most of you have not visited Haiti, that I would I decided to concentrate on there. What? Can you, that better? Okay. So I'm going to start with this. This is what I knew about the hospital Albert Schweitzer before I arrived. The hospital was founded in 1956 by Dr. and Mrs. William Larimer Mellon. Born in 1910, Larry Mellon was the somewhat black sheep of the super rich Mellon family of banking and oil and whatever. After one year at Princeton, he opted to go to Arizona and establish a cattle ranch. To the surprise of his family, he was successful. In addition to being a successful rancher, he was an accomplished musician and linguist. From his childhood and through his prep school and college year, he made friends with and spent time with servants and workers of all sorts who spoke a variety of languages. He was fluent in Portuguese, Spanish, French, German, Greek, and knew some Arabic. When the Second World War was started, he was recruited or volunteered <laughs> for the Office of Strategic Services that preceded the CIA and sent to work as a spy. He served in North Africa, Portugal, and Spain. On returning to the US, he was inspired by a short photographic essay by Dr. Albert Schweitzer in Life Magazine in 1949. Larry was struck by Schweitzer's philosophy of reverence for life and his commitment to serving people in Africa who had no access to medical care. Dr. Schweitzer was, of course, a well-known German theologian, a professional organist, and when he felt the call to serve in a different way, in his early 30s, he added an MD to his PhD, theology doctorate, and music doctorate in order to be a medical missionary. He gave up his seminary appointment, his organ concerts, and moved to Lambertinet in what was then Gabon. Larry Mellon wrote to him at once, and they maintained a correspondence for the rest of Schweitzer's life. While waiting to hear from Dr. Schweitzer, Larry began pulling strings to see if he could go to medical school. Let me say that he had better connections than most applicants, and despite having only one year of college, he was admitted to Tulane Medical School in 1950. Even Larry Mellon would agree that he was a weak medical student, but he did finally get his MD degree. Following Dr. Schweitzer's advice, Larry and his wife Gwen began looking for a place to serve. Their aim was a place that had little or no medical services. The two areas in the Western Hemisphere that they explored were the jungles of Brazil and rural Haiti. Haiti, the poorest nation in the Americas, won. While Larry was in medical school, Gwen worked as an assistant to a tropical medicine researcher dissecting mosquitoes. I think dissecting mosquitoes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, through negotiation, uh, uh, and she received training as a lab tech. While Larry was finishing school and doing his internship, Gwen went to Haiti to start building the hospital. Through negotiations with the government, they bought an abandoned banana plantation and surrounding land. The President Magloire designated the hospital a regional center to serve 92 villages. The hospital was completed and opened in 1956. There was a farm to raise vegetables and a pasture for cows and beef cattle. Haitians were hired to manage these, although the Mellons knew quite a lot about beef cattle. Recruiting staff from the United States involved a network of family and friends and in 
and in Haiti from other mission establishments. They created a foundation, the Grant Foundation, based in Pittsburgh. By the way, Gwen Mellon was a grant of the W.T. Grant family, so that they were not poor. Uh, anyway, the Grant Foundation began raising money and helping with contacts in the U.S. My mother became an early contributor, which was my introduction to what she called the Mellon Hospital in Haiti. Mother had a lot of faith in the Mellon Bank. <laughs> I never gave the whole enterprise a thought after I left home until I was a teaching fellow at the Children's Hospital in Boston. Another woman doing a fellowship introduced herself one day and we began to have lunch from time to time. Renee Bergner was married to a medical student at Boston University and she was working to support him. She told me that when she was an intern at Bellevue Hospital in New York City, her department chair asked her to go to the hospital Albert Schweitzer in Haiti for a month. He told her that Dr. Mellon needed help and had asked if any pediatric residents were willing they could have a developing world experience. Renee said the opportunity was presented as more of an order <laughs> than a request, so she went. Her husband was then an attorney and he went with her. While she did medicine, her husband Art helped Larry Mellon lay pipe from a spring behind the hospital to bring clean water to a near village. Both Bergners became close friends with the Mellons and went back many times. Art decided to go to medical school so that he could be even more useful. I was fascinated by her stories and remembered my mother's interest in the hospital. When I finished my fellowship and was moving to Durham, Renee told me that she and her family were going down to HAS. I'm going to call it HAS because Opital Albert Schweitzer gets long. Uh, for a long stay. We kept in touch over the next couple of years. And finally, in 1971, she suggested I should come down for a month while she and Art were there. After thinking about it for a while, I applied to the Grant Foundation to volunteer for a month, explaining that I would like to be there when the Bergners were there. The reply was a bit terse. We don't need you when the Bergners are here. <laughs> So I settled for the month of October after they had left Rome and their practices in Burlington, Vermont, where their oldest daughter was getting ready to start school. I received a packet of information about how to get there, what to pack, and necessary immunizations. I discovered that Dr. Mellon's reverence for life did not extend to bugs, although, doc, uh, uh, although Dr. Schweitzer's did. One suggested item was raid spray, and another was insect repellent. Another item that puzzled me was boots. I was to regret that I did, ignored that one. To respect those customs, I was to wear skirts, no slacks or shorts, and flip-flops and sandals were acceptable footwear. They sent a packet of reading material that was heavy on the treatment of malnutrition and tuberculosis. Finally, I was to start malaria prophylaxis one week before arrival. I was given a couple of reference books to, uh, references to books on Haitian history and politics, which were quite thorough in teaching me that I had never understood how, how real, what real poverty was. The first, oh, sorry, I have, to, I have to skip. When I stepped off the Air France plane in Port-au-Prince, at the end of September 1972, I could hear the noise of a crowd outside the arrival area. The customs officer looked briefly at my passport and waved me on. I came into an open courtyard filled with a milling crowd, mostly men in sports shirts or t-shirts, talking and gesturing. The few women were in colorful skirts and blouses with scarves around their heads. A handsome black man in a white suit with a white shirt and a bright colored tie holding a small notepad in his hand came up and greeted me politely in English. Bonjour, I am Monsieur Jolique, he said, a reporter for the newspaper. Bonjour, I said, re resurrecting my French. Would you be going to the Hôpital Albert Schweitzer? What is your name? I told him my name and that I was indeed going to that hospital. 
You will be staying at the Hotel Olofsson today, I am sure, he said. I was wondering how he knew all this and why any Haitian would want to read about me in the paper. <laughs> Monsieur Jolicoeur was, however, snapping his fingers and gesturing, and a cab appeared. My bags were loaded in the trunk, and I was ushered into it. He waved the cab on, and in 15 minutes of scary driving through pedestrians, minibuses, and cars, we pulled up in front of a beautiful white hotel with a broad veranda. The driver happily accepted my dollars and hauled the luggage to the porch. I went inside and was ushered into a room with tropical plants and huge rattan chairs that looked like they had come from a movie set. A burly man in a gruff voice asked me to have a seat and introduced himself. I am L. Burchard and I own this place, he said. <laughs> you are going, you're the doctor going to the Schweitzer, I assume. I agreed that I was and asked if I was expected. Yes, he said with a sigh, another freeloader for the night. I am expecting another couple for HAS, and I expect you will all be collected tomorrow by someone. He had me sign in and then called a staff member to take me and my luggage to my very elegant room. The large room had a bed, a seating area, and a balcony that overlooked the front lawn of the hotel. I unpacked what I thought I would need for the night and then heard a knock at the door. It was a waiter with a large drink with an umbrella in it. <laughs> Welcome to the Olafsson, he said, handing me the drink. The music will start in a few minutes. I took the drink out on the balcony and looked down to see a group of musicians gathering on the lawn. Sure enough, I was soon entertained by the small band and a trio of singers. The music was lively, and the people standing on the steps below me were clapping and some were dancing. So far, my volunteer service at a rural hospital in Haiti was turning out to be like one of those old tropical movies, complete with a wild collection of characters. When I went down to the lovely dining room, I was seated at a table for one. Dinner was served from soup to dessert without my having to order anything. It was all delicious. Across the room at the dark paneled bar, I saw Monsieur Jolicoeur perched on a stool. He raised his glass to me and smiled. After dinner, I saw Mr. Burchard and I asked him if Monsieur Jolicoeur lived in the hotel and if he were a reporter. Thank God he doesn't live here, he said. But he is a reporter, not for a newspaper, but for Papa Doc Duvalier, who had replaced Magloire as the president, president for life of Haiti. He comes each evening to see who is staying here. <coughs> the next morning, Mrs. Gwen, Gwendolyn Mellon, arrived. She, with her husband, had established uh, a hospital. Oh, I already told you that part. Oh, just stop, wait a second. Yeah, anyway, she arrived. Uh, everyone in the Port-au-Prince and maybe everyone in Haiti knew her. She pulled up in an antique Land Rover to collect me for a shopping venture. We drove into a busy market, found a parking spot in an unpaved area. There was a row of shops, but there were many little tables with umbrellas over them and individuals wandering about hold, with trays holding small items to for sale. It was hard to find any shop or table with any quantity of goods to sell. The food shops had mostly oranges and bananas, rice, and a selection of canned goods. There were shops with tourist goods, pottery, and folk art. Mrs. Mellon greeted people, brought some food supplies, picked up some art supplies, and had us back at the hotel in an hour. At the hotel, my bags were loaded and a young family appeared on the veranda. This was Dr. Scott, an ophthalmology resident at Yale, and his wife and two preschool children, who were also going to be at HAS with me for the month. We all packed ourselves into the Land Rover and started out of town. Dr. Scott asked how far the hospital was, and Mrs. Mellon said it was 85 miles. She added that it had been built by the U.S. Marines in 1926. The U.S. occupied Haiti from uh, 1915 to 1934, so that's when the road was. 
The age of the road became apparent rather quickly as it had minimal paving and maximum puddles. Uh, we stopped about noon for peanut butter sandwiches and soft drinks on a beach with a thatched shelter. We had left Port-au-Prince about 10.30 and Mrs. Mellon said we were about three hours from the hospital. It was apparent that the road made 85 miles seem like 300. The children found the trip trying as adults, as the adults. Finally, about 3.30 p.m., we drove onto the campus of the hospital. It was like an oasis. There were palm trees and other tropical trees, a beautiful swimming pool, and a number of very elegant houses. I learned later that the long-term volunteers lived in these houses, and they were the plantation houses that had been restored. The hospital was a low, light-colored stone building surrounded by a high brick wall with a wide gate that had an arched sign over it saying, Hôpital Albert Schweitzer, with a large courtyard in front. Next to the hospital was a large, low house of the same stone that was Dr. and Mrs. Mellon's home. These were added when the Mellons um, bought the property and added new buildings. I was whisked through the hospital and out the back door to my apartment in what was called Ward 3. It had three rooms, a very large sitting room, a bedroom half the size of the living room, and a full bath. My Haitian guide through this non-tour was smiling and chattering in Creole. You know, Creole has a very limited vocabulary and only one uh, pronoun, Lee, and uh, it's all in the present tense, so my French was definitely not helpful. I just kept smiling and nodding. I did understand that dinner was up at the hospital at 5.30, as that part was in English. I unpacked and went into the bathroom to freshen up. My introduction to wildlife began there. A large tarantula was occupying the bathtub. I decided against the shower and just sponged off at the sink. After this orientation, it was time for dinner. The dining room was filled with a mix of staff from maintenance to the medical personnel. Everyone greeted me warmly and I finally met most of the medical staff. The chief of pediatrics was Florence Marshall, always called Skeets. She was a small, thin woman with blonde hair streaked with white and badly arranged teeth. She had a big smile and a very direct way of speaking. She told me that a third pediatrician was to arrive the next day. He was a resident, a pediatric resident at the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and was coming with his wife. Skeets introduced me to Frank Lepro, the chief of surgery, and I learned that both of them had been involved at HAS from the beginning. Skeets rotated from her practice on Long Island every third year, and Frank came off and on from his practice in Providence. They were pleased that I knew the Bergners. Skeets obviously missed Renee because she didn't need much supervision and, and I must have been seen along with other newcomers as needing a lot of HAS education. There was one other surgeon and two internists. Dr. Scott, the ophthalmologist I arrived with and an elderly obstetrician were the rest of the medical staff. The latter two looked somewhat bewildered and I suppose I did too. After dinner, it was announced that there would be a movie. Tables and chairs were moved and a screen put up at one end of the room. I was sitting near the, uh, the uh, window as the movie began. I became aware that there was someone outside the window. I could just make out a shape. Uh, the, I nudged Skeets, who was sitting next to me, and pointed Oh yeah, she said there are probably lots of Haitians out there uh, to watch the movie. You can't see them because they are so black. I mean, they were pure African. And they seem to know when it's movie night. And, and I'm just going to do a little deviation to say uh, that the thing that it was the most impressive was the smell of the Haitians. The Haitians are clean, bathing regularly, but without the benefit of deodorants and other fancy stuff, 
And working in the tropics makes sweat, right, <laughs> and smell. Then there's this, they, they, they cook with, and their houses are, if, if they ever need heat, it, heated with charcoal. And they, their major <laughs> food, often, is the oranges or lemons that are around. And so there's this combination of charcoal, sweat, and lemon. And, and, um, and, and it, it just epitomizes Haiti for me. The villagers called all white women Mies, M-E-E-S. And as I walked around after dark, I would often hear Bonsoir Mies before I could see anyone. But sometimes when the wind was right, I would get a whiff of that distinctive smell and say Bonsoir before the men could startle me. To this day, when I occasionally get a chip, a whiff of charcoal slash lemon, and I am instantly transported back to Haiti, I even feel I should acknowledge the presence of a gentle black man who will say, Bonsoir, mis at any second. Now, after the uh, after this is now, I'm going to talk. I'm, I'm moving on. I, I know this isn't going to be very long. I'm not going to give you medical, <laughs> the medical stuff. But uh, but the major problems of the Schweitzer Hospital were, and I count them five. And for children, malnutrition, um, tuberculosis newborn tetanus uh, and um, and assorted GI what's is and every child was in, infested with worms and they gave all of them worm medicine <laughs> in the waiting room and so by the time I saw them it was it was all in their diapers or whatever I mean I saw more worms than I had ever seen before anyway there was a serious lack of faith in the postal system of Haiti at Hôpital Albert Schweitzer. The only way mail was, was sent or received was carried by arriving visitors or departing staff. The hospital was visited somewhat regularly by representatives of the Grant Foundation, which was the funding agency. They maintained an office in Miami, although the main office was in Pittsburgh. Mail from family and friends of staff and volunteers was sent to the Miami office and delivered on an erratic basis when visitors came to HAS through Miami. Similarly, when volunteers or staff members left or had to leave, they carried mail from HAS to Miami and put it in, in, in and turned it in at the U.S. Post Office. I, had, I inadvertently created a crisis at HAS because I had no idea about all this. Actually, I was so busy at the time, I didn't even think about riding home. My family became anxious when they heard nothing, whether I had made it to De Chapelle or whether I had survived the trip. <laughs> at the end of my second week, I was summoned by, from, uh, from my clinic by the nervous Haitian woman who was the registrar at the desk. Dr. Mellon needs to see you right now, she said. And I said, right now? You must come with me, she said. I followed her to the office where Dr. Mellon, looking very serious, was sitting at his desk. He picked up what was obviously a telegram from his desk and came to stand near me. We prefer not to be noticed all that much by the Haitian government, he said. Dr. Duvalier in particular, <laughs> I just nodded. I realized that HAS had been granted permission to care for the 92 villages and that this permission had been given by the previous president. There was real trepidation that Dr. Duvalier might, as a physician himself, want to renege on that permission and have the whole operation back under the Department of Health. I have a telegram from the United States ambassador that arrived this morning. He said as he handed it to me. I read, Dr. Pounds, is he there? Is he well? They all thought 
doctors were all doctors, they were all men, right? Followed by the ambassador's name and titles. I suddenly realized what had happened. Even if I didn't see that this involved the Haitian government, <laughs> my brother-in-law was a foreign service officer currently stationed at the State Department. I realized that my parents and sister must have asked him to see if he could find me, and it turned out that he knew a way. <laughs> I explained and apologized to Dr. Mellon, who it seems remained anxious about it. He said he had responded to the ambassador that I was alive and well in De Chapelle. The implied message was, don't let this happen again. <laughs> I sent several letters out the next day with the departing volunteer and told my family not to do it again. I still didn't think that Papa Doc Duvalier was reading other people's telegrams, but perhaps the paranoia was correct. When it came my turn to leave, I was asked to be a mail carrier. I was glad to do it, but unprepared for seeing a scruffy, old 21-inch suitcase packed tightly with letters, tiny flat packages, and postcards. As I was in the air over Miami, it occurred to me that the United States Customs might find this mysterious enough to ask me what was in here. It was with some trepidation that I approached Customs when we landed. The flight was not very full, so the agents all looked fairly bored, giving them plenty of time to hassle anyone, I thought. The agent I met smiled nicely and said, did you come from Haiti? Yes, I did. Do you have mail in that suitcase? He said, astonished, I said, that I did. Everyone from Haiti or Bolivia brings a lot of mail back, he said. Take it over to the barrier and you'll see a post office box on the other side. Put the mail in there and then come back. And I was feeling relief as I leaned over the barricade to dump all the stuff in the mailbox. When I returned, he said with a grin, we think that's the post office's problem, not ours. <laughs> My last week in Haiti, I reflected on the exceptional devotion of the staff and volunteers in trying to make a difference in the lives of those who had so little, led by Mellon's huge commitment of their lives, their wealth, and their faith in the people of Haiti, everyone cheered every success and mourned every failure. HAS was an impressive and humbling place to have seen in action. I thought Dr. Schweitzer would have approved, except for the killing of bugs. So I'm just going to skip over and, and tell you that um, when I was leaving, I, I've written this, but it's in a, buried in a paragraph. I met a volunteer coming from Emory University, a, a, a um, cardiologist, and he came down every, I, I was leaving the first week in November, he was coming down, he would cover Christmas for so volunteers could go home, for uh, U.S. volunteers could go home for Christmas. And he, he asked me, if I felt that I had changed anything <laughs> by, you know, taking care of all these malnourished, tubercular, whatever kids. And he said, and I said, he said, you know, what they need, you know, is sort of better government, all kinds of, of uh, they need employment, they need industry, they need all this other stuff. And he said, health is in there, but it's not the first thing. And so I said, well, I'd like to think that maybe one of those children is going to grow up and change Haiti. And he said, you have a lot more faith than I do. <laughs> anyway, I just told Carol, the, the surprising thing was, that it is still surviving despite the uproar in Haiti. And today, I got an email from them uh, uh, telling me that there's going to be a Zoom something for old volunteers. But there have been hundreds of volunteers from the Netherlands, from Canada, et cetera. And, and, and it, is, it, it was an amazing experience. You know, and I, learned, I really learned a lot about diseases that we, ne we never see. Anyway, 
That's it. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Uh, I was I was there four and a half weeks, and uh, the uh, the usual tour is, is is a month. I mean, for short term volunteers, but long term volunteers go for either a year or some go for two years. And 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 the other thing, uh, one of the things I learned, which we women should think about, was maternal mortality, in a, if a patient, a woman has tuberculosis and gets pregnant, the pregnancy gradually compresses her lungs so she's not symptomatic, but as soon as she delivers, it blooms and the mother dies. And so the Dutch nurses, they, <laughs> they were from a, a Dutch reform unit, they had a clinic that put all, I mean all, the women in the tuberculosis clinic, they put in IUD. Now the Haitians are 98% uh, Catholic and 100% voodoo believers. And so she, as, as they, they, but they were obedient to coming to do, have this done. Not that they knew what it was. And so they, uh, but they always told them, they said, you know, this isn't, uh, compatible with your religious faith. And they did it, I mean, they did, you know, they didn't protest, and so they, but if they could <coughs> prevent a pregnancy while the mother was treated for her tuberculosis, then she would survive, and then the baby would survive. I mean, it was, it was, but, but I had to laugh that I walked by one time and I heard one of them saying, uh, you know, this is really not compatible with your religious faith. <laughs> and I'm thinking, <laughs> and they, and they, spoke, they, the ones who came down did learn Creole. I never did. My my uh, uh, interpreter told me to stop trying to use French because <laughs> their language is part Dahomey. It is a mix of African and French. And, and it's so limited. To, so anyway, it was a great experience, and I'm glad you listened. Yes, 